What's up, everybody? It is Megan and Sim today on the podcast. Thanks for listening in to Student Loan Planner. And I think we're going to kick it off. We've never done a podcast episode together. Uh, so I thought it would be fun if both of us just shared like a fun, quick fact, and then we can jump into um, the topics we're going to cover today, which are some stuff from the inbox, some technicalities about loan repayment that we're seeing, and um, also processing stuff for PSLF waiver. But Sim, why don't you kick it off with a fun fact about yourself? Hey, everybody, Sim here, and I hope that you find this fun fact as fun as I do. So in college, I was supposed to read War and Peace, and I just didn't. So I am tackling it now. Um, many of you know that I'm an avid reader, and so currently I am chugging away 20 pages a day, sometimes more, with the goal of finishing it in two months. Oh, my gosh. And how many pages is it again? You tell me. The version I'm reading is 1,317 pages. There's a lot of Ooh. footnotes about like the historical context, which believe it or not is actually interesting. Um, I yeah. wish I had read it when I was in college, like I was supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you are not the only one like list. I know I'm guilty of this, but like books that you were assigned in school, like how many of those books did you actually read cover to cover? Like probably not a lot of them. I don't know. Maybe I'm just speaking for myself. <laughs> so there's plenty I could go back and like read and probably appreciate today that I probably just kind of skimmed through like back in school. <laughs> Sorry. It's teachers. just so <laughs> tough when you're like balancing a, you know, a tough course load and everyone thinks their class is the most important, but how about yeah. you, Megan? <laughs> what, what are you up to? What's fun about you? So we were joking about this before. I'm such a like nerd. I was like, gosh, all I do is talk about student loans, but that's not fun. Cause of course I'm, you know, we're doing this podcast talking about student loans, but so maybe something different. Uh, we just got a, a griddle. So not a grill, but an outside griddle. And it's been really fun. I love cooking. Maybe that's a fun fact. I really love cooking and experimenting with food and we got a griddle and it's so it, you can make breakfast on it, like pancakes, bacon. So we did that one morning. That was really cool. I'm learning how to make the perfect like burger, uh, like meat patty, like the spices that go into it. So that's been kind of fun. Um, and then, yeah, I guess that's my fun fact is I'm, I'm learning how to cook on a griddle more outside since it's now the summer months. <laughs> I'm coming to Megan's next cookout. Yes. Uh, oh, and yeah, I, I love hosting. That's something I'm learning now that we're in our new house. Um, hosting is very fun for me. I, I know a lot of people don't like it, but I, I will host your, well, <laughs> I shouldn't say this on the podcast, but I love hosting parties. I've done a baby shower already. My sister's uh, engagement. I have a ladies wine weekend coming up with my mom and my grandma and my aunt. So Ooh. yeah, I, I guess that's the fun fact for today on me. <laughs> But now let's jump into what people listen to this podcast for, and that's the student loan topics of this week. And we've got a lot of different topics. I figured we could start with topics that are going to be probably relevant to most people who have student loans, and then we can get into some more specific PSLF waiver uh, topics. Um, but why don't we go ahead and kick it off? Uh, I'll shoot you the first bullet point if you want to talk about how Aid Advantage is asking people to recertify right now. Have you heard that from clients? Oh, yeah. I just got an email from someone I met with earlier this week who received not only a, a notification that they were going to have to recertify this month, but they also gave him a payment that was pretty off from what we expected it to be. For those of you who don't know, for recertification, the earliest that anyone's going to be required to recertify is March of 2023. And so the deal is, if you had a recertification date that fell between now and March 2023, your recertification date is supposed to be pushed out by a whole year. And so, at least in the case of, you know, this client that I met with, what I told him to do, first of all, was share the, the text just straight from studentaid.gov where the, you know, the announcement was made which he did, and he asked the, um, the customer service representative to please explain to him why his recertification would be sooner. So we're still waiting on that. But advocate for yourself. Know, know when you're actually supposed to recertify. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I think, I mean, I could maybe chalk this up to that aid advantage is new, newer, because they had just inherited uh, Navient's loans. 
Um, so maybe they're still trying to work out their processes, but that's a pretty big deal. Like if you're asking people to recertify or making it sound like it's required before it actually is, because that can really negatively impact somebody's maybe forgiveness path going towards income driven forgiveness, making their payment maybe higher than it should be earlier than it should be. Um, but Another thing to maybe look out for, uh, Department of Education also sends out loans. And maybe let me back up and say the relationship between the servicers and Department of Ed. Department of Ed are the servicers' boss, bosses, I guess you could say. Um, they're, they're the hub of all things federal student loans, studentaid.gov, Department of Ed. So the emails that come from them are probably more general, just, hey, here's a mass update to pr pretty much anybody who has federal student loans, stuff that maybe you should pay attention to. Um, but the servicer is who is in charge of your account specifically and can answer more specific questions about your payments, is supposed to be able to answer more specific questions about your recertification date, um, things like that. So that's a little bit about the relationship between the two. Servicers are contractors for the Department of Ed. And uh, Department of Ed is kind of housed within studentaid.gov for communications. Um, so people have also been sending me emails from Department of Ed slash studentaid.gov that make it sound like you should be updating your income-driven plan. And the language goes something like, hey, you know, payments are resuming soon. Um, make sure your income is updated. And it's not telling you that you need to update income. It's just saying that, hey, if your income has dropped or if you, if you want to adjust your income-driven payment before payments resume, go ahead and do so because you can do that through studentaid.gov. So don't let that throw you off if you get a, a more general email. Um, go with student aid's guidance that no one has to update before March 1st of 2023. Um, no one needs to update before then, but let's get into the next bullet point. Um, now that we know payments will at some point kick in, we're still kind of up for debate on, is it going to be September after the August 31st deadline, or is it going to be, you know, 2023? I think me and you both think it might be 2023. I think Travis kind of goes back and forth. I think we're all kind of going back and forth a little bit just because of the <laughs> confusion, um, but how can we figure out what our interest rates are right now on federal student loans? Yeah, so there are a couple of different ways. And so I found this out actually today. So I'm not just someone who advises on student loans. My husband has student loans, some kind of right there in the trenches with everyone. And he was part of, um, and we'll kind of get to this in a little bit, but he was part of the transfer to Mohala. And so I was just kind of poking around today and I noticed that after you kind of go deep in the website, if you look under the loan details, you can actually see current interest rate is zero if you have you know, direct loans and then post COVID interest rate. So what your interest rate is going to go back to um, when the waiver expires, whenever that's going to be. And for the record, I'm pretty staunchly team January 2023. Um, that's just one way. Another way is if you log on to studentaid.gov and you can kind of pretend as if you're going to complete a consolidation application, it'll actually show you all of your pre-COVID and I guess post-COVID interest rates. And if you were to actually do the consolidation, which a lot of people are doing right now, um, what your new interest rate would be. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's a great way to find if you're trying to plan, trying to figure out where, you know, what your interest rates are for some number crunching. Those are some two ways you could find them. Um, on the consolidation application, there's also, it'll total out your loans towards the bottom of that, that first initial page. And it gives you it gives you the weighted average interest rate on there. So if you want to help doing just that math, it's right there for you if you wanted to know what that is. Um, so that's good. And um, another big topic that I think is relevant to everybody or uh, some folks, I should say, uh, is the Mohila transfer that's going to be happening as of July 1st from FedLoan, right? Because we we saw that from was it one of your clients or? one of the team's clients that sent us a screenshot of that. I think it was someone from the team. Got it. Yeah. So the, basically the, the transfer from fed loan to Mohila, we knew was coming. Mohila is the new servicer that's taking over for public service loan forgiveness. Um, and, and they were, they, they're also taking over for non PSLF folks. They were one of the servicers that were 
getting loans divvied out to them by Fed loan. Um, but it sounds like they're making that transfer officially all from Fed loan over to Mohila by July 1st. So that's less than a month away from now. Um, and what does that mean? So I think a lot of people get a little nervous about servicer changes. We talk about this quite a bit on the, the podcast because there's been so many servicer changes lately. But Sam, if you could maybe talk about the impacts of a servicer change, what it actually means for people uh, to maybe calm the nerves. <laughs> Yeah. So first of all, I won't sugarcoat it. It's probably going to be a little bit messy to do such a massive transfer in a relatively short period of time. Um, I do want to kind of calm people down, though, and remind you that in no way will this affect, for example, your eligibility for PSLF. Um, you're just going to kind of have to wait a little bit, be patient while, you know, they update their records and everything gets transferred over. But it's not going to in any way affect um, what you're trying to do. Now, I do know that some people are, are still nervous about it. So what I've kind of told some people to do is take some screenshots of your history, if that makes you feel better. All of your data is stored by the Department of Education. So it's not like your data is going to get wiped out. But if you feel more comfortable having, you know, a record of your payments or um, for PSLF, what payments were qualified and which ones are still waiting on an employment certification, you can save all of that and, you know, always come back to it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So there's, there's always going to be the disruption with a transfer, but thankfully no one's in repayment while all of this is going on. I think that could have made it a little more complicated with trying to figure out who to send payments to. So I'm glad that they're getting it done now or, you know, soon before payments kick on for everybody. Um, well, good. So that's, that's a good pop topic. Um, I do have one more thing to add to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for PSLF right now, it's also kind of a question, where do you send your employment certification form? So officially on all of the paperwork, everything still says, send it to Fed loan. So with a few people, I told them, let's try sending it to Mohela because they're your new servicer and let's kind of see what happens. And so far I, I have not heard from anyone that those forms have been rejected. Um, there probably is still some time because for a lot of people, you know, they're, they're going for PSLF with the waiver. So they still have to do a consolidation. So we're probably building in like a two month buffer, but um, that's going to be another question is once this transfer is done, when can we start sending the paperwork directly to Mohela? Mm -hmm. Yep. And you're exactly right. When you print out the employment certification form for PSLF, the instructions still say to mail it to fed loan, or at least as of June 9th, when we're recording this, <laughs> Um, but what is interesting, I took a screenshot from somebody's uh, correspondence that they got recently. They were someone who had to do a consolidation and get moved over to Mohila because the consolidation application doesn't let you go to Fed loan anymore. Um, so they got moved over to Mohila. They submitted their employment certification form to Fed loan as the instructions told them to. And they got a letter from Fed loan that read something like this. It says, we reviewed your PSLF uh, certification application based on your employment and other information. We determined that you have eligible loans and that your employment qualifies for PSLF. However, we do not know yet whether you have made 120 payments to be eligible for forgiveness. Before we can determine if you are eligible for forgiveness, all of your U.S. Department of Education loans uh, owned, or U.S. of Department of, oh gosh, let me say that sentence again. <laughs> before we can determine if your eligible loans um, or before your loans are eligible for forgiveness, the loans must be transferred from your current servicer to the new PSLF servicer, Mohila. This letter used to say Fed loan. So that's interesting that they're now acknowledging that, hey, Fed loan's not really taking over these loans anymore. It's, it's going to be moved over to Mohila. After Mohila receives your loans, they will determine how many qualifying payments you have made for PSLF, and you'll receive instructions and updated, um, uh, basically an updated payment count from, from Mohila. Your transfer to Mohila is presently expected to occur within one to three months. Your current servicer will continue to support the management of your loans in the meantime. Please continue to make any required on-time scheduled payments, which it, that's not relevant right now. But the significance of this is that there was this weird flux period that we were, you know, as the team of consultants were kind of going back and forth on the Slack channel on like, you know, this is so confusing. Like, do people send it to Mohila? Do they send it to Fed loan? 
are people going to get sent to Mohila and then dragged back to Fedlone? That was something one of my clients had an experience with, but it seems like we're now at the point where they're divvying up those responsibilities. Fedlone is acknowledging that they'll still accept those employment certification forms, but Mohila is going to be taking over the management of not just PSLF, but probably also the PSLF waiver from what it sounds like. Um, I think Fedlone will still be in the background supporting and helping finishing that out, but I think we're starting to see some clarity on that transfer process. All right. Well, now that we had talked about the transfer of Mohila to Fedlone, um, let's actually, I thought it would be helpful to talk through consolidation, do kind of like a consolidation process talk through. And why, why I think this is relevant. Well, consolidation, and let me maybe back up and explain what consolidation is. That is where we combine our federal loans within the Fed system. So I don't mean refinance, taking the loans to a private company. That's a totally separate process. Consolidation keeps the loans federal. Um, but we are in the summer months after a lot of folks have graduated. Consolidation right after graduation could be very, um, you know, this is a, a great time to do it. Um, it's also probably necessary for those who are pursuing the PSLF waiver or possibly even the IDR waiver to take advantage of some of the, the, the waiver opportunities going on right now. So a lot of people are going to be talking about consolidation. A lot of people might have to be doing consolidation. So we thought it would be helpful to have kind of a talk through of what to expect when you do that. Um, would you like to start, Sim? <laughs> yes. And for those of you listening, um, if you want to follow along, you can actually just type into Google like studentaid.gov consolidation demo. They were nice enough to put out a demo so you can kind of play um, if you were to do a consolidation yourself. But I'll try to talk it through for those of you who are listening. So the first thing you'll do is um, log in. So make sure that you know what your login information is um, for studentaid.gov. Um, if you're actually doing it, or you can just hit start demo. Mm -hmm. And then if you just go straight to the like homepage of studentaid.gov, that's fine as well. The way that you can find this consolidation application is by going and hovering over where it says manage loans in the top right of your browser. Um, and then drop down under the second column at the bottom, there's a section that says consolidate my loans and it'll take you straight there but you can also probably Google it and find the same thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm a chronic Googler. I find things so quickly that way, but if you want to do it like the exact way, listen to Megan. <laughs> so once you have the application pulled up um, and Megan, I'll let you click start demo. Um, if we want to get like a screenshot of that. For it's being slow. I have it pulled up over here, so I'm going to okay, I'll go it. stop sharing mine. <laughs> so when you, when you log on, the first thing it's going to say part one is select the loans to consolidate. So if you were to do this, you would actually see a list of all of your federal student loans. And what you'll see is the loan type, um, the loan servicer, the loan balance, and there it is, your interest rate. If you've been looking for it, it's there. You get to choose which loans um, you're gonna consolidate. Most people do all of them. Um, there's sometimes reasons why you wouldn't, but for the most part, people do all of them. And then what you'll see is a section right underneath it that says your new consolidation loan. So it'll have the new loan amount as well as the interest rate. When you do a consolidation, um, what they do is they take your interest rates and they do what's called a weighted average, and then they round it up to the nearest one eighth of a percent. So a little bit of math, but you don't have to do it because they will do it for you. <laughs> The next section asks if you want to select any kind of processing delay. Um, most people select no for that. Then you get to do a servicer selection. So a lot of people right now are consolidating because of the PSLF waiver. And so you can check yes, that you are consolidating um, because you're employed, you either are or were employed full time by a public service organization. So you can select yes. And then under federal loan servicers, there's a drop down box and you'll see a list of all of the current servicers for federal student loans. If you're consolidating specifically for PSLF, you're going to select Mohela. Mm -hmm. and One then, note on this as well is when you select Mohela, if you select OSLA servicing, if you select Advantage or Ed Financial, 
you're going to get a little pop-up that says, oops, let me switch to Mohila. Well, normally you get a little pop-up. I say, got the pop-up. Megan's computer's slow. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what's, there it is. <laughs> Gosh. Anyways, it'll say, hey, by the way, you know, you've selected Mohila, but your consolidation will be processed by Aid Vantage. Um, basically what this means is Mohila has just delegated and some of these companies have delegated the consolidation process to Aid Vantage. Um, so you'll get correspondence from them, but your final servicer, like who collects your payments long-term will be who you selected. So that's something that I know is throwing people off, um, but something to be aware of. Yep. That's exactly right. And then that's the first section. The second section is about choosing repayment. So at the top where it says you get to kind of estimate your payments, um, oftentimes these estimates are, are wrong. So, I mean, I, I, I'm biased, but I suggest booking a consult with us where we get a lot of information and we can kind of help you estimate what your payments are actually going to look like. And we can kind of do some planning there. But in general, you'll, you'll start off by filling out your adjusted gross income, which you can get from your most recent tax return. It's um, line 11 on the 1040, um, your state of residence your tax filing status. So if you're single, married filing jointly, married filing separately, um, whatever the case may be for you, and then your family size. I tell people just totally ignore the next section where it has your payment estimate. And then at the bottom, um, repayment plan request. Again, there's a drop down box and then um, you select which payment plan you would like if you're doing the consolidation. If you're just going through the demo and you're curious what it looks like, you still need to select a payment plan to be able to correctly see the rest of the demo. So just select something. So I'm just clicking on um, pay as you earn. If you're allowed to have like a favorite repayment plan, that's one of mine. I know that's a nerdy thing to say. <laughs> um, the next section asks you for um, your employment information. So do you work for a nonprofit or government organization? So you'll say yes or no there. And then once again, it's asking you about your family size, which you've answered previously, and then your marital status. So married or single. Um, then there's this question that everybody is asked, regardless of whether or not it applies to you, right? And the question says, if placed on the ICR, which is Income Contingent Repayment Plan, do you want to repay your direct loans jointly with your spouse? If you're not going on the income contingent repayment plan, this question is just totally irrelevant and you can select no. If you are going on the income contingent repayment plan, then you'll kind of select the response accordingly. Yep. And this, uh, just for some background on this question, we, uh, so doing a little more digging, ICR, so this is more in regards to if you're married. You won't get this question if you're single, but if you are married and you both have student loans, then with when you're on repay pay or IBR and your spouse is on an, a, a repayment plan as well, um, they will the, the loan servicers are supposed to proportionalize your payment between the two of you. So let's say you have 60% of the household debt load and your spouse has the other 40%. You're both on an income driven plan doesn't necessarily have to be the same one. You'll get 60% of the household payment if you're filing taxes jointly and your spouse will get 40%. So they don't double up on your payments. If you're married and you, you're filing taxes jointly, they proportionalize the payment, but ICR is different. Income contingent repayment, which we rarely recommend, or it, it's rarely applicable, but for some cases, especially with the PSLF waiver, we have been seeing this a lot more lately. Um, ICR, you have to specifically tell it that you want it to proportionalize your payment. That's why it's asking you this, if you wanna repay your loans jointly with your spouse. So if you said no to this, you were on ICR and your spouse was on ICR, you both would have a huge you know, household payment for each of your loans, not divided between the two of you, if that makes sense. So that's a little bit of background to that question. Um, one other piece, just cause we get a lot of questions about this too, about family size. So what does it mean uh, you know, for other dependents or dependent children. Well, when you're selecting your family size for an income driven plan, um, it's not necessarily the same as what you selected for your tax return or tax status. Like if you have dependents or not, it's more so just matter of fact, how many children, including unborn children are in your family and receive more than half of their support from you. So that's, that's the question. It's not, you know, did you claim somebody on your tax return? It's more so 
are you supporting your, your child? So this, this could be relevant for college kids still living with you. You know, <laughs> if you're supporting their, you know, housing, you're feeding them, you're paying their health insurance still, but you're not claiming them as a dependent, you could still claim them as, as part of your family size uh, for student loan purposes. And then the other dependent section, this is how many other people, excluding your spouse, excluding your children, live with you. This is key. So who lives with you and receives more than half of their support from you. So if you have a aunt or uncle or a parent living with you, you pay your mortgage, they don't really chip in uh, to that, or you're, you're paying a lot of their medical bills, then you can claim them as a, a dependent under here. Again, doesn't have to be tax dependency status. So I wanted to touch on those because we get a lot of those questions, but. Yeah, that's a good clarification. Mm -hmm. And then if you keep going with the, the demo or with the consolidation, the next section asks you to literally like link live your tax return straight from the IRS website, which is really convenient, right? You don't have to worry about mailing it. You can do it right online. Um, there can be some strategy around the timing of which tax return you, you choose to do. And what I mean by that is some people still haven't filed their 2021 taxes. They filed an extension. So the question is, if you're trying to get the lowest payment possible, are you going to get a lower payment if you use your 2020 tax return or should you wait until your 2021 taxes are done? Because they're going to use the most recent tax return that they have on file. So there could be some strategy to waiting until your tax return's done. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Great. Okay. Then the next page. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, you go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. The next page asks you, for some more information about your tax return, even though they have it. Um, I kind of like to joke that this is like when you're applying for a job and you send them the resume and then they ask you like, when did you work? You know, all the, all the employment um, time periods that you've worked and the years and all that, you're kind of just refilling everything, but this is kind of like that. So it asks you how you filed with your spouse. It says, did you file jointly with your spouse? Yes or no. It does ask you if you're separated. Um, that can sometimes be strategic as well, depending on um, what you're trying to do with your student loan payment. Um, and it does ask you if you're able to access information about your spouse's income and have them sign this application. Um, don't commit fraud, guys. If you have access, say yes. Some people who are separated try to say no. Um, like there's very rare instances where you actually don't have access to your spouse's information. Um, I've seen that happen sometimes with military couples when someone's on a deployment. Um, Generally, though, you probably have access to their information, so say yes there. Mm -hmm. Then the next question asks you if you filed a federal income tax return for either of the two most recently completed tax years. Most people, that's yes, even if it's only 2020, you have that. Now, the next question here is super important, right? It says, has your income significantly decreased since you filed your last federal income tax return? Have you lost your job? Have you experienced a drop of in income? Because of COVID, this actually applies to some people. Some people did lose their jobs. Um, some people did experience you know, pay cuts or maybe chose to become a stay-at-home parent during that time. So if you select yes there, um, that question will prompt, um, well, first of all, did you earn any taxable income? And you can say yes or no. If you still have some income, but you're just earning less, you're going to be allowed to use what's called an alternative documentation of income. So the default for calculating your payment on like an income driven repayment plan is they start with your tax return and they're looking at your AGI, that line 11 that we talked about. Um, but you can request to use this alternative documentation of income like a pay stub. So you can kind of prove, hey guys, I'm earning less now than I did since I filed my tax return. Another time you might use this, and this is kind of particular, but if you live in the community property state, and you're trying to lower your student loan payment, some people will file separately. And community property states are weird because it's not like this is what I earned, this is what my spouse earned. What they do is they total all of your income and divide it by two. So effectively what's happening is the higher income earner is shifting some of their income onto the lower income earner. Um, if you are the higher income earner and your spouse with the student loans, and this is a, a fabulous strategy for you, if you're the lower income earner and you're the one with the student loans, that's going to mess up your AGI. So you're going to want to use the alternative documentation of income in that, in that instance and use your pay stub to prove, hey, I actually make less than this. Mm -hmm. Yep. And a couple elaboration kind of tips on this too. 
Um, so going back, some of these questions you may not get, especially if your tax return pulls through great, because it, it can read if you file jointly or separately. So you may not get that question, um, but it will definitely ask if you're separated from your spouse. Um, and if you say no, it's automatically going to check yes to the next question where it says, are you able to access information about your spouse's income and have them sign off on this application? I get this question a lot where someone will say, do I have to say yes to this? Do, is it supposed to be required that my spouse has to sign off on this? What if I'm filing separately? The answer is yes. A couple of reasons why this is the case. Um, even if you're filing taxes married separately to keep your payment off of just your own income, your spouse still has to sign off on this application. One, because you do get a payment deduction for being married. So if you say no to this, then your, your payment is not as low as it could be. And then two, they want to confirm that you are filing taxes the same way. <laughs> so they want to make sure that your spouse also has a separate tax return on file. Um, and so that that's kind of a checks and balances kind of system there. And then the other reason is, uh, well, actually there's two other reasons. So another reason is, um, if your spouse also has, has student loans and they need to proportionalize the payment between the two of you, uh, they need to link you two together. So they need to figure out who your spouse is. So they knew who know who to divide the payment between. It doesn't combine your loans. Sometimes that's confusing for folks. Um, but it links the two of you together. And then the last thing is if you are on revised pay as you earn, this is required regardless because revised pay as you earn is the plan that will always in include spousal income regardless of how you file jointly or separately. So those are the four reasons why they, they want your spouse to sign off on this. Now, it does not mean that they're committing to this loan in any way. Um, they're not tied to it. It doesn't show up on their credit. It is just for their purposes of, of checking these few things. Um, so I think those are a couple of things I just wanted to touch on there. Um, awesome. So next page, I'll let you continue to take it away, Sim. This is the next page. And this is when I'm doing a consult with someone and we're walking through the, this demo. This is usually where I stop and I kind of tell them, this is the legal jargon. Go through it and let me know if you have any questions. And I want to comment on one thing. I don't know if this is still in here, the language is still in here, but I heard from someone a couple of months ago who actually did take the time to read through this, that um, it had scary language saying that if you consolidate, it's gonna start your clock over. For PSLF, for the waiver, um, that is not the case. You actually, um, in some instances, you have to consolidate. If you have fell loans, you have to consolidate because you need to have direct loans. Um, for the IDR waiver, same thing. If you're trying to take advantage of that and you have a commercial fell loan, you have to consolidate. You're not gonna start the clock over, um, you're covered there. It, that used to be the case without the waivers and probably will be the case when the waivers expire, but for now you're okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know that's like a terrifying thing for people because for a long time we were like, don't consolidate if you already have credit, <laughs> like don't do it. But now the waivers are overriding that language, which is making things a little confusing because then we're kind of going back on what we used to say but now the, the waiver does supersede, is that the right word? The, the language of this because of its executive order. Um, so don't panic if you, you will also just a heads up, you'll get a letter if I think they're still sending these, it's the old language, uh, the old notices that they send out automatically that when you consolidate, it'll say something to the tune of, are you sure you wanna consolidate? And yes, if we're doing this for the waiver for PSLF or IDR, or if you've just graduated, like you have no payment history to worry about losing anyways, then it's okay for you to be doing this. And after October 31st, however, of 2022, we probably don't want to be doing this until we know what's going to happen after that point with the language. Definitely not after this year, because the IDR waivers language is saying that we could do this all the way up until the end of this year. So more to come on the IDR waiver in future episodes once we have more details on their implementation of this. But generally, I would say it is safe to be consolidating definitely before October 31st, 2022, um, and also before the end of this year for IDR waiver purposes. All right. Now the next page, 
is more so about your personal information. So this is where it's going to start to just have you double check your address, your contact information. It'll ask for a best time to reach you, which is a little interesting because no one ever really calls you about your federal student loans. They'll email you or mail you. Um, but make sure that all of that information is up to date. It will also ask for references, which is sometimes a little confusing to folks. Um, references, this, what this is used for is if you were to stop making payments and they could not contact you by your contact information on file, hypothetically, they would reach out to one of these references to see if you had moved or if you had died and <laughs> try to get in contact with you. Um, so just, you can put somebody who does not live with you or two people, sorry, two people that do not live with you and that don't live with each other. And you may have already put someone on here in the past. So there's like a little section towards the right that allows you to pre-fill the, um, the reference, which might be a little easier and quicker. And then after that's done, you'll hit continue. It'll give you a review of the consolidation application. And then there's a box to check at the bottom and a place for e-signature. Then that gets submitted. Anything you'd like to add, Sim? Um, not about the demo, but we can kind of segue into talking about multiple payment, payment accounts for PSLF because it's gonna kind of circle back to the consolidation application anyway. So mm -hmm. the deal is that some people have, and, and I don't know if this is what you meant, Megan, by this, so I'm gonna kind of go down this rabbit hole, but. Some people maybe on like one group of loans have, I'm gonna say 50 qualifying months for PSLF. And then maybe on a second set of loans, they have hundred qualifying months for PSLF. Without the waiver, you basically have two different timelines for PSLF, right? The hundred, um, the loans with the hundred months have you know maybe 20 months to go and the other ones have 70 months. Now that we have the waiver, and this is a really awesome thing about it is that you can actually consolidate all of the loans together You'll probably have to resubmit possibly an employer certification form, but when you do the consolidation, that new consolidation loan is going to be credited with the highest number of qualifying payments for PSLF. So basically, those loans that have maybe 50 qualifying payments just got a nice step up to 100. Mm -hmm. Yep, I think that does, in a sense, open a little can of worms, but it's it's such a good can of worms, but it's the payment count differences. And we've talked a little bit about this on prior podcast episodes where, you know, should you do this if you have payment count differences on your loans? And the answer is always, it depends on your situation. If your payment count difference is within like a couple payments of each other, the answer is probably no, because it, it's not really worth the paperwork or the time <coughs> for that consolidation to get processed to, to get them all on the same payment count. If it's only a month or two uh, different. But if you have vast differences between loans because you had some from an undergrad degree or you, you know, just whatever reason, if there's a vast payment difference, then consolidation could make a lot of sense for PSLF purposes to get them all on the same page with the same timeline instead of, you know, one being done in five years and one being done now, for example. Um, so that's something to think about is, you know, if you have a slight payment difference between loans, don't worry about this. But if there's a bigger difference and it could get you to PSLF a lot sooner, then it could be a consideration. And the other thing to think about, too, is when you do a consolidation, that's going to trigger a recertification of your income. So if you are only like two months apart, is that really going to be worth it to have to potentially have a higher student loan payment when payments restart? Yep. That's a great point. Cause we get that question a lot in the inbox is, you know, if I consolidate for this PSLF waiver, does that mean I have to update my payment? And the answer is definitely yes, because it makes you reapply for the income driven plan. So again, that's why it's like, if there's a mass payment difference or a significant reason for you to be doing the consolidation, then yeah, it's worth it. But if it's not, um, don't worry about it. Cause it, it'll, it could make your payment a lot higher sooner than it needs to be. Um, but that's a good point. And along the same lines as PSLF, so now we're definitely getting a little more into the PSLF waiver. Um, one thing we know and we've recognized with clients is um, employment certification forms. So two, two notes on this. First, the PSLF help tool is much faster for processing times. Uh, so the PSLF help tool was developed a couple of years ago 
It is helping people input their employment information, like adding their employers and on the spot checking the EIN numbers to make sure that the employer is eligible for PSLF right then and there. If it's been in the system before, it'll tell you right off the bat that it's eligible or not. If it has never been in the system, meaning you work at maybe a very small nonprofit that probably no one else has tried to go for PSLF under before, you may get the um, note that it's not that they're not sure if it's eligible. Don't let that scare you. If you know it is a 501c3 organization or you know that it's an entity that could qualify, still submit the documentation. They might ask or submit the employment certification form. They might ask for additional documentation, which is okay, um, but it, it's probably just because they haven't seen it before and they need to verify. So don't let that scare you away from submitting one. But help tool is definitely uh, the way to go when submitting these documents because it processes them faster from what we can tell since it's already um, approving, not approving, but like double checking the employer and it gets it in the right format those who manually print this document out and write everything in, I've been seeing them get kicked back and denied for really frivolous reasons. Um, and it, it makes me think that these applications are being processed by a machine, kind of like a resume reader, if that makes sense. So the PSLF help tool puts it in the exact format it wants to see it in. And if it falls outside that format, it might get kicked back because it, or if you know a person doesn't catch it soon enough to like look at it manually. So that's my guess, but um, definitely use the help tool to, to have faster processing times. And another quick note on ECFs or employment certification forms is that it seems like mailing those or uploading them to the portal is much faster than faxing. I've been seeing the fax, the people who have faxed these not get responses too quickly. Um, so for whatever reason, maybe mailing or uploading is a lot faster. That's the last note on that though. One more comment about PSLF, this is for you teachers out there, is if you're a teacher who is trying to go for teacher loan forgiveness, the deal used to be before the PSLF waiver that you could not go for both PSLF and teacher loan forgiveness at the same time. You could not use the same period of time to count for each program. Well, they waived that, so now through October, um, the end of October, um, you can use the same period of time and you can go for both programs. I know that some of you are thinking, well, does it matter? I'm going for PSLF. It's all going to be forgiven anyway. But I always say, why not get, you know, tax-free forgiveness when you can? I think it gives you a nice little psychological boost to get a little bit of your loans forgiven. Teacher loan forgiveness is not very substantial. There's one of two amounts you could get um, based off of whether or not you're considered a highly qualified teacher and where you teach. Um, but the amounts are either 5,000 or 17,500. And I always like to, for the people who are like, well, 5,000, I always convert that to how many times can I go to Chipotle? <laughs> that's just me. <laughs> that's, that's my currencies. Um, that's my conversion there. But um, yes, it. if you want to go for both, you can go for both um, for a limited period of time. Awesome. All right. Well, we've gone through some technicalities. Anybody who listens to this podcast and hears me knows that I love technicalities when it comes to student loan stuff. <laughs> I really get into the weeds. So this was fun. Uh, let's wrap this up with a couple questions that we got from the inbox that could be helpful to discuss. And then we'll wrap it up with a few notes at the end. You want to take it away, Sim? Sure. So let's see this one. This one's really, um, I'm going to pick the shorter one here. So this person is asking, can I apply for PSLF if I was in school and haven't made any payments yet? How we began working for a call. Sorry, I, that wasn't like fully grammatical. So I, I'm stumbling over that a little bit. This person, okay, I'm going to summarize. This person is asking, can they apply for PSLF if they were in school and they haven't entered repayment yet, but once they started working, they are working with a qualifying employer since 2020. The answer is yes. So the rules for PSLF, there's four rules. Um, I won't go over all of them, but the big one that has not changed with the PSLF waiver is you still have to work full time for a qualifying employer. So what you'll need to do is um, submit the employer certification form. And I tell people do this at least every year, stay on top of it. Don't wait till like five, 10 years has passed um, and get your employment certified for that time period. And it will count. And yes, yeah, that's what we've been seeing. So, uh, and why I think someone was asking this is because technically you can't really, I mean, you could be in repayment, but it's not standard right now. 
So this person is asking it because they haven't entered repayment on an income driven plan quite yet. So they're trying to figure out, well, do I get credit for the, you know, the past forbearance months? And the answer is yes. Um, and then one of the last questions or another question that I thought was pretty interesting was just, I've seen a few adjustments to my payment count for PSLF since the latest benefits were added to include months in forbearance. So this is interesting because we haven't quite seen anything standardized yet with forbearance being counted towards PSLF. Uh, this is via the IDR waiver where they're going back and looking for 12 months of consecutive forbearance or more or 36 months or more of forbearance aggregate. Um, so this person seems to have seen some adjustments already. Um, however, not all months of forbearance have been adjusted only the first month of each forbearance period I've used. I'm about to certify employment for the year, but I think I'll be at 120 when all these month forbearance months are adjusted. Could submitting my employment certification trigger these adjustments to be made faster? Um, you might not like this answer, but my, my answer is we don't know <laughs> because we have not seen anything standardized with the forbearance counts being added yet. Um, I, a few clients have told me that when they talk to a representative at FedLoan about submitting multiple employment certification forms, they made it sound like if you have already had, if you already had one, let's say you submitted one a month ago for your current employer and you're trying to get them to hurry up and add, you know, add up your payments that they, they want to submit another one. Well, apparently the FedLoan rep told them that if they submit another one, it's going to kick them to the back of the line to where they're now more recently submitted. And, you know, so I don't know if that's the case, if it might delay, if you were to submit another employment certification form. Um, I mean, either way, you're gonna get processed. I know the timing is probably the most frustrating part right now for a lot of people is just waiting to see that payment count update or for the loan forgiveness to actually come through. And now more recently for the forbearance months to be, be added. Um, but the, the question, you know, the answer to this question is we're not totally sure. Um, if you feel like you have hit 120 payments or you've made some significant progress on the payment count since the last time you submitted one, then yes, definitely submit a new employment certification form. Um, but we're not quite sure about if it makes you, you know, get looked at faster or not. Anything you'd like to add to that, Sim? No, I think you covered it. And I think we're at time. So I want to do one quick announcement for those who are listening. Um, if you guys follow Travis's newsletter, and if you don't, I recommend that you do, because that's our fastest way of getting updates out to everyone. <laughs> If you can get your 20 best friends together or your coworkers, um, we are doing free webinars on the PSLF waiver. So click on the link that Travis put in his um, newsletter to see if we can make it work. And if we're the right fit, then um, we'll give you some free information and hopefully we can help. And if you don't get the newsletter, just shoot an email to help at studentloanplanner.com, inquire about it, and we'll make sure that you get it. But uh, thank you guys for hanging out with us today on this podcast episode. If you've lasted till the end, it, it was a good ride. <laughs> it was a pleasure, Sim, to, to chat with you about some of these technicalities and student learning details. And um, we'll see you on the next one. See you guys. <laughs>